sent, didn't we send out KZ's letter? Her husband. Remember we made copies. Good evening. This is the January meeting of the Cape Elizabeth School Board. Before we start with the meeting, I'd like to uh, invite a former chairman of the Cape Elizabeth School Board, Priscilla Hare, to come forward and make a mystery presentation. It's a mystery to me, I think. I hope you know what it is. But. <laughs> I'd like to introduce Audrey Jordan, who's with me. We are representing the Main Street 90 Committee, and as a committee, we took on many projects during the past year. Because of the many projects, we broke down into small subcommittees. And the two of us were fortunate enough to serve on the Education Subcommittee, along with Loretta Pond, Charlie Greer, and Sue Weatherby, who represented the schools. During the year, we recognized many exciting things that were going on in the school or were initiated by our committee. Oh, most of the children that were involved received certificates during the year, and lots of doors have the Main Street 90 uh, logo on them because they participated. Well, the town has taken great pride in what has been achieved by this committee, which we are going over next to town council tonight, and we've taken great pride in what we see going on in the schools as far as building their knowledge of Cape Elizabeth and how they feel about the town. But tonight we would like to formally thank Loretta, Sue, and Charlie for their effort and the time that they put into this committee. Could you come here a minute, please? Thank you very much for all your help. Charlie, Charlie thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you very much for all the help. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. And congratulations, and thank you for your your good work, all of you. That's nice. The uh, first item on the agenda is adjustments to the agenda. Uh, are there any adjustments by anybody on the dais? Uh, I did receive a communication from Barbara Powers um, earlier this week after we had sent out the board packet. I did attempt to send it out. I know that some of you received it, some did not, but uh, whether or not you're prepared to actually act on it this evening, I would like to add it under new business so that there can be some discussion. Okay, we'll make that item C. Any adjustments uh, to the agenda or anybody uh, from the public wishing to speak tonight? Okay, seeing none, we'll uh, move on to the approval of the school board meeting minutes of, uh, for December 11th, 1990. I only have one comment, and that is under point two. The vote is recorded as 4-1 with Charles Greer abstaining. I think an abstention, I think the vote was 4-0 the abstention doesn't count, I believe. Is that correct? Everybody agree with that? Any other comments? Charlie, you've got one, don't you? No? Sure? Okay. You found it. I so seldom get one, I wanted to you know, <laughs> grab it. Uh, then I would entertain a, uh, a motion that the minutes be approved. So moved. moved. Seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor? That was a five nothing vote. D, the business manager's report. Thank you, Peter. Uh, this being the six month period ending uh, December 31st on page 38. 
Revenues for the general program are, are in at 51% of anticipated revenues, or 4.512 million out of a possible 8.8. .8. The following page outlines the uh, expenditure summary for the six month period ending December 31st. To date, we have expended 48% of our budget, 47% out of the elementary school, 49 out of the middle, 48 in the high school, and 54 in the district wide accounts for a total of 4.293 million. Any questions on the expenditures? The following page, page 40, outlines the federal and state grants that Cape Elizabeth has applied for and received for 1990-91 school year. We anticipate revenues of $183,000. To date, we have received $132,990 and have expended $40,435 with a balance of $92,554. Uh, the following page outlines the food service program for the six month period. Uh, I've given you a, a page, a summary page, call 41A to supplement this schedule. What page 41 does is basically a cash reporting system. Uh, as of in December, we did have a, a loss for the month of $5,769. The year-to-date total, counting the $25,000 that was transferred from the general budget to the school lunch appropriation account, we have a cash uh, to the plus of $10,212. However, page 41A summarizes what that really means in a fund balance. So what I've done on page 41A is kind of outlined for you the cash plus all the uh, inventories plus the unpaid bills and plus the receivables that are due to the school lunch program. <coughs> Column number C is the 8990 program and to date, as of December of last year, we had a fund balance decrease of $13,914. This year for the same period, 1991 school year, we have a decrease or in, a, in the fund balance of $764 for a variance of $13,149. Hopefully the trend keeps up for the remaining five, six months of operation. Yes, Lori. Are you going to start reporting to us with this additional information? Every month. Yeah. Every month, because this makes it much clearer. Oh, it is very puts much. The, puts it in much more uh, cause, perspective. Because you'll notice the, you know, the it's deceiving because the unpaid bills last year in the same period were, were, uh, were twenty three thousand four hundred fifty nine dollars, while this year for the same, uh, for the same period is seven thousand seven hundred twenty seven dollars. So, you know, the, the cash method is fine, but if you don't pay your bills at the end of the month, you're looking great. If you do, then you're losing money. So basically, this reflects the request we made of you last month. That's correct. Good. It's, any questions? Further questions on that? Community Services outlines the, the following two pages where they have taken to date revenues of $345,000 and have expended $232,000. The last report that I usually do is uh, is the enrollments. Uh, last month we had uh, 1,571 students. This year, we, this month we get 1,574 students. The following four or five pages gives you some history as to the uh, the fuel oil costs for this year compared to last year. The uh, transportation costs as far as Gasoline, diesel, and unleaded gasoline for the same period, along with the uh, electricity log for the same period. Would you summarize that? Sure. Uh, the fuel oil in the buildings, 
to date, to date, uh, we have purchased we have purchased uh, 56, 57,000 gallons of uh, number six fuel oil at an expenditure of roughly 31.5, with an average cost of roughly 55, 56 cents a gallon. Last year, for the same period, we had purchased uh, 70. 5,000 gallons of number six fuel oil at a cost of $32,000. So dollar-wise, we're right where we were last year, but as far as usage, we've, we're saving like quite a few, well, it's three truckloads left. Is that tied into the energy savings? Not yet. The energy, the energy savings, the, I reported last month that we anticipated the energy management system to be online in our school, prior to the Christmas break, it is not online. What we've been informed lately is it will be online come the end of uh, January. This ties into, uh, if you'll notice on the top of your, that same page, you get degree days, 1989 versus 1990. The month of December of 1989 had uh, 1,573 degree days compared to 964 in uh, this past year. For the year, it was 7,000. 467 for 89 versus 6,462 for uh, 90. I think that might have a lot to do with the usage right there. It's uh, curious that the, uh, that the usage uh, seems to have fallen a smaller percentage than uh, the degree days would indicate. The degree yeah. days are down by an enormous percentage, almost 30 percent, and uh, the gallonage is only down about 6 percent. The, the only way we could, we, we could uh, measure that though, Peter, we'd have to take a reading come July 1st to see where our tanks were. How many times do our tanks turn over in a year? Oh, uh, good question. Cold month. Or how many gallons of tanks do we have? 200,000 gallons. 200,000 gallons. Roughly and and our consumption for, for so far is, is uh, almost 100,000 gallons. Mm -hmm. So That's a lot of money that could be sitting at the end of the season in, uh, in underground tanks, isn't it? Quite a bit. With what effect on the budget? So we get uh, fifteen one in, in uh, for gallons and uh, uh, twelve five as far as t holding tanks. Fifteen one at the middle school with twelve five at the high school. Well, what would happen on our budget if we had a hundred thousand gallons sitting unused at the end of the heating season? That would have been paid for in one year's budget, but it would be used the next year. A hundred thousand. Well, I'm, I'm asking you, you have a 200,000 gallons of, uh, of no, no, capacity uh, at the no, end no, of the no, season. No, no, that's the whole year's, no, no, 200,000. Oh, okay. No, what's your storage capacity? That's what I'm getting 15, at. 15.1 plus 12.5, 26.7. Oh, okay. Sorry. 26.7. Going off on a tangent. Wrong. At 50 cents, it could be $13,000. Okay. That's not a thing. Good. Uh, the following page. Charlie, you have a question? <clears throat> what's holding up the installation of the energy management system. Each month you say you expect for the end of the month, and we've heard this the last three months. I think what's happening, Charlie, from what I'm gathering from talking to the, the people that are running all the, the, uh, the lines or the wires out there is that it's, it's a bigger project than they anticipated. Right now they're, they're tying in like uh, middle school, Pond Cove is mostly done. Now they're tying in through, they're running it through uh, a cable that already exists underground. There was more wiring to be done than they anticipated. And and I believe there's only two people on the job site versus probably three or four that they anticipated. But we had hoped we'd, we'd be doing the work. Uh, the following three other pages outline the, uh, the transportation costs as far as uh, gasoline, diesel, and unleaded gas. Then again, last year we averaged uh, roughly 70 cents a gallon for uh, fuel. This year we're at 99.9 .9 cents or a dollar a gallon. Dean, on both of these you show shortfalls, one of uh, $20,815 on fuel oil and another shortfall of 9000 9, on fuel, on gasoline. So we're talking approximately $30,000 in shortfalls. With with the assumption that we, we buy uh, 182,000 gallons of number six fuel oil at an average price of 60 cents. 
So and right now we're below that, so. So that's okay. the anticipated shortfall. What, what I didn't do in this report is I didn't, I didn't change the bottom numbers. I, I should play the game and say that so far we're paying 55.86 gallons. Okay, that's fine. So, I'd, have, I'd, I'd appreciate yeah. that. If we, yeah, I what, what this says to me now is that we're, we're projecting, based on budgeted use, a $30,000 shortfall. To date, the way, correct, John, but to date, to date the way the, the weather's been holding out, the way the, the, uh, the price is, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's stabilized, but. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'll adjust those few minutes. Now. It's probably more like 15 at this point. And the last three or four pages has to do with the energy uh, or the electricity log for the three buildings. Uh, we met last week with uh, CMP. Uh, I had some concerns about our uh, our uh, demand costs or being high or higher than uh, than last year for the same period of time because we got we have done some uh, lighting projects we have done uh, a few projects in energy management that I feel should have uh, reduced the uh, the amount of uh, the demand plus the uh, usage I'll be updating you people uh, the next not next month the month after possibly in March as to their findings we can do an audit well, what they're doing is they're running a uh, a uh, a printout for us that every 15 minutes your energy your demand charges are uh, are red in in any given month. Then you live with that for uh, a period of 11 months at 80 percent of that that higher charge. So they're looking at it. They they provide us with some information. There's more to come in the next couple of weeks. They have to request that from Augusta. That's all I have. Yeah, I think uh, one thing you could do, D, I think, is uh, create a one-page summary and just pull the uh -huh. the principal numbers off onto one page. If if nothing else, it will save uh, a lot of paper. But in, in I I think this is what you've been asking for. We've all been asking for is this kind of information. Uh -huh. no, as you start to use the Mac Macintosh is super. <laughs> Get away from the. Uh, the hammer and chisel and the uh, slate that you were using. Yeah, but one of the things that the Macintosh can do is it can create very simply an interrelated database which will allow you to create that one page summary. So, yeah. <laughs> Joe, you have a I'll come down and do it. Or I'll get Sue Weatherby to come in and do it, right? Approval oh, and <laughs> approval and non-approval of school buses. Can you just explain oh. what's going on there? Uh, back in November, I believe, we had uh, asked at the state we asked the state to approve two buses for Cape Elizabeth School Department. Uh, they did approve one 25 passenger with a, with a lift. What happens is that when we go on a field trip or a lot of class trips in, of a sort, uh, sometimes we have to send two buses if there's any, 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 any handicapped kids accommodated the, the class. So they did approve the 25 passenger with the lift for I think it's 48 or $50,000. We propose to fund it over a three-year period. You'll see it in the, in, and they did deny the other bus. But so these requests have nothing to do with the, the one we approved of in no. last year. This is a request that every year the, 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 uh, the state uh, has a $5 million bond issue for school bus purchase. This is part of this. The other bus that we just received in November was paid for last year's budget okay. and reimbursed in this year's. Uh, D, you told me uh, earlier in the week uh, what the state aid is likely to be reduced, but that was not necessarily hard information. Do you have any later information? At this point, the last numbers we got could be anywhere from 18 to 20,000 to probably a max of 45,50 for the remainder of this, year. of this year's right. allocation of money. Uh, Dr. Goldman and I spoke about it last week, and we have. Uh, there is a, a freeze, if you want to call it that, where uh, we have instructed the principals to, uh, to uh, talk to their staff, and any request has to go to the principal's office and through the central office for uh, approval as far as all purchases from now through June 30th. Uh, I'm going to a meeting Friday in, in Auburn where the state people, the finance people will be speaking to the Business Managers uh, Association and hopefully have some, some data for us. Uh, it's not definitely. 
And we have not, to date, received a printout for uh, 91, 92 allocation as far as state funds for next year. Usually we get that uh, December 20th or so. Well, I think in this uh, budget situation, uh, we'll be lucky if we get it February 20th. Well, now they, the memo we got is, uh, what, January, end of January? We should have a printout in our hand. Good. Any other uh, questions, comments on the business manager's report? Okay, thank you, Dee. Thank you. The uh, middle school representatives, are you out there? They are, I see. Rachel, are you going to talk tonight? I can hear you. <laughs> thank you. Um, good evening, I'm Rachel Walls, and this is Lynn Powers, and she'll be presenting with me tonight. Um, last night, the parents of over 100 sixth grade students um, assembled to get a demonstration from the Twonky Foundation represent representatives about um, their children's five-day stay in um, the Wiscasset program in the spring. Um, the middle school population has also taken on a recy recycling as a school project um, for the sea air and it will be fo focusing on many aspects of recycling as ways to promote the environment and also to help the town save money at the transfer station. And the seventh grade um, last week completed a all-day trip to the Boston Museum of Science. And the eighth grade um, will have junior achievement um, volunteers in their social studies classes during the third and fourth quarter. Um, the middle school welcomes the new teacher, Mr. Crosby, as a Spanish teacher, and Ms. Larkin as a student teacher in the French class. The last day before winter vacation, the eighth grade class went roller skating instead of the snow activities <coughs> due to the fact there wasn't any snow. Um, the Bruce Roberts funds will be the recipient of money raised by the sixth graders. And girls basketball season ends with the eighth grade team managing to have no injuries. And the students who played were very lucky to have Joe Doan as their coach. And the boys' first game is tomorrow at Lake Region. Thank you. High school representatives, please. I'd like to begin by first distributing the SAC Constitution to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. We've been working on it for about a year and a half now, so it's after a lot of work. The old one got lost. We don't know where. Know where it just sort of got lost over the years. And we thought that um, the Constitution would give us some direction and some power because things are set, set forward in the document. Um, it's finally been ratified and signed. And in our next SEC meeting, all of the members will sign it. So it will become really official then. I have a letter from a concerned postgraduate of the high school I'd like to read for you. Dear school board members, for many years I have pondered the meaning of our school nickname. Throughout grade school, middle and high school, I was often asked, what is a caper? After numerous years of deliberation with family, friends, schoolmates, and reference <coughs> material, I was left with a spice of some, sport, some sort, though what it was put in, I'm not quite sure. I realize that the school board has a great many weighty topics, but I, on behalf of a great many citizens of this town, wish you would take a little time to consider a change in our school's nickname. I realize that our nickname has been a long-standing tradition, but of what? I find it difficult to endear myself to a nickname that has no character or presence. I know a great many others agree. I want to present to you my recommendation for a new nickname, a nickname with power, feeling, emotion. It would be a great pleasure for me to root in the future for the Cape Elizabeth Tide, 
Roll Tide, a nickname with power and a connection to our seaside town. Thank you for your time, and I hope some consideration will be placed on this issue. I have talked to many capers who feel that this is an issue which merits action. Sincerely, Craig R. Conley, class of 86. I'd also like to comment on the SACs. We're, we're trying to get a Greeley exchange going with the high school, and we're thinking of doing that after the midterms, after all the confusion with, with the scheduling and stuff. So that, that's pretty much definite. Um, the possibility of a senior class trip to Chewankee in April is being discussed. The senior class is going to have a meeting tomorrow about that after the half day. And the sale of raffle tickets to benefit the senior class project graduation are on sale now. Um, the winner of that raffle wins four tickets to a Celtics game in March with limo service and picnic lunch. So buy your tickets. As you know, it's been a very difficult couple of weeks for us in the high school and everyone in the community. And I'd just like to take this opportunity to publicly thank the community and especially our teachers and administrators for helping us through this difficult time and easing us back into school in somewhat of a smooth transition or as smooth as possible and as can be expected. And also, Mrs. Goldman, we are planning to invite you to an SAC meeting. However, we're not sure when our next one will be. So we do plan to wait until after midterms to formally invite you. Thank you. Thank you. The interim superintendent's report. The, um, some of the items on here have also partially been addressed by business manager, so I will sort of go right on down. I'll pick up from the student report um, and share just very, uh, in general terms, for the community's benefit. Uh, the recent tragedy involving high school students was, a, was and is obviously will continue to be a time for reflection. Um, for certainly deep sadness and for um, many, many, I'm sure, private conversations and uh, family uh, counseling sessions as well as what goes on in the community. Um, I was very impressed with the response of the administration and staff at the high school. There is something called a quick response team in place, that is the structure of that team is in place uh, that uh, can be used at any building. Uh, it brings people together um, just as the title says, a quick response to try to look at what resources are available for us for counseling or for any of the other issues that may uh, need to be considered on staff and to bring in community or in the larger sense in the Portland area community um, people. I was very pre impressed also with uh, what I've seen of the student body um, uh, in many respects. And unless there are particular comments and simply leave it at that. I know that uh, it's been a time of sadness for the community, including the school board and administration. Going on, um, the budget issues. Uh, Dee has already pointed out uh, some of our issues that I had here coping for the FY91 budget issues. We have been enormously fortunate with the weather. Uh, the oil situation uh, led us to do, and I really appreciate these work in getting, beginning to get a handle and, and use the um, capacity of the Excel program uh, and the MAC in general to uh, track the um, almost a, a month to month record now what we're spending on these things. Uh, so far, we are with reasonably within budget. We are a small, geographically a small area. We do not face and have not, at least so far, faced the same kinds of problems of a school administrative district such as SAD 6, where we've read in the newspaper. Uh, they cover many, many more miles than we do. They have many more buses, so that the whole thing can escalate much quicker. Our bus runs are within a 12 square mile limit, so it's one of the reasons why we're still within uh, manageable proportions here. And of course, we've all benefited from the uh, mild weather. Let's just hope that keeps up. Um, there are other issues that are impacting us. He already has mentioned the somewhat unclear situation from the State Department. We do know we are going to be impacted. Um, I have prepared a memo which will be going out to the administrative staff. We've had some verbal communication about this, and uh, when it goes out, I will make sure that you get a copy. 
essentially uh, we will be keeping all essential programs going. Um, we are not going to have to do anything particularly unusual, but we are keeping tight um, tabs, if you will, on non-essential spending. Um, at this point, we think that will do it, but if we see anything more, uh, we will keep you informed on that one. We just want you to be aware that we are, are keeping track of it. The budget timeline, I do have um, a sheet to distribute to you this evening. We have been in touch with the town council. Um, I think that's it. Pass it down. I didn't count those. I'm not sure if this is mine or yours. Are missing one? Okay, good. Uh, we, what you see here is a calendar, a tentative calendar. We will ask you uh, at this time to check those dates. You don't have to give me an answer this evening, but I do obviously will need feedback from you as to whether or not these things are possible. What you see at the top of this uh, budget timeline sheet is a review for uh, internal purposes the uh, budget review that's going on right now, as a matter of fact, meeting with individual principals um, and myself and Dee. Uh, we've listed some board workshops. You'll notice they begin Thursday, February 28th. Um, and I simply tried to follow the schedule that you appear to have had in the past uh, with three uh, workshop days during the week and one Saturday session with an if as needed Saturday session for the following week. Um, clearly if you need to change those you can let me know later. And you will notice that we are scheduled to meet with the town council on March 14th. Um, community and school services meet also. They are really a third um, warrant for town. That's why they're listed separately uh, as of March 25th. It's my understanding from looking at past records that this timeline is about a month in advance of what you're used to. Uh, we are following the lead of the council in this one um, and uh, meshing our schedule with theirs so that you can meet with them. Uh, I understand that you have to adopt your budget by May 30th on, and although we are talking about the possibility of having a public hearing and budget adoption as early as April 8th, which is well in advance of that. I think that it's the town manager's intention to get this timeline moved up so that we can cope with any of the emergency conditions we may have to cope with um, in dealing uh, with adjustments from the state. Uh, at this point, unless you have see some obvious uh, problems, uh, you can look at this later and, and get back to us so that we can change it. It's intended to be tentative and give you a I, I see only one date that uh, gives me some trouble, and that's April 8th. I will return from a 10-day business trip. I shouldn't say that because it's partly pleasure, but a 10-day trip uh, on April 7th. Now, I don't know what would go on that, uh, this, during that week before April 8th, but I guess I'd have a preference to make it a couple of days later. Anybody else have any trouble with any of these dates? Isn't April 8th the actual town council meeting? It's a second Monday, which I believe is a town council meeting. Oh, that's official town council meeting. You have the town meeting? That's when they adopt the budget. Right. Yeah. Oh. That's not a date we have any control over. That's oh, I see. Okay. Oh, that, okay. That's the town. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's fine then. Then we will have done our work by then, wouldn't we? Uh, I would hope so. Oh, definitely, yeah. Okay. Uh, it doesn't, um, does it say this on here or not? I guess not. I am intending to present you with our administrative recommendation for budget at your next month's meeting, that is at the February board meeting. Any comments or questions on that? Okay, moving on. I have one question. Yes. Um, back to your freeze. Uh, freeze on all non-essential spending of discretionary funds. Can you just elaborate a little bit? Basically, if, uh, for instance, at this point, if we see some, uh, you know, we have a PO system whereby, uh, you know, things have to be listed as to what they are and so on. 
supplies and various other kinds of, uh, uh, let's say, some kind of supplementary textbooks uh, type of thing that might not have been ordered at this point. Somebody has decided they need them. Now, there we have some uh, programs that uh, depend on yearly spending in a progressive manner. That is a program such as industrial technology. Obviously, they buy supplies that they need on an as-needed basis. We don't intend to disrupt the student program. But if we think that uh, we don't understand uh, the necessity for a particular item, we will simply question the department head, the principal, whoever um, is particularly is closest to it, and um, be satisfied that we do have a genuine need that cannot wait. I think part of the issue here will be um, if we could generate any kind of surplus, this would certainly be helpful in the budget situation that we are looking at. Although our first concern is to preserve the quality of the programs for students. We are not trying and nor will we make any inroads into things that directly impact students. But if there's some expenditures that are borderline that can be put off, could be, let's see what happens with the oil, let's see what happens with these things, that will be the kind of thing we'll be looking at. The reason I, I bring this up is because last year there was a freeze put on by the superintendent and considering the impact of what went on during that spring and we're in far worse shape, I just want to, to make sure that we aren't creating any kind of slush fund or anything else, you know, that we're jeopardizing. Suppose that we had a bare bones budget and I, and I would hate to see field trips and those type of things which are part of the curriculum eliminated? We don't have any intention of eliminating things. We might question some things that we think are redundant, um, but it, the field trips that are taken, uh, for instance, that are, we've had some discussion of some of those that, that do in fact cost something. Uh, those have been tagged in the budget. We don't, I don't see any necessity at the present time to curtail those unless there might be uh, some use as, in, as spring progresses and we get closer to the end of this, if we see we're in trouble, some of those things will perhaps be cut back on. Um, I'm thinking more uh, in the nature of particularly buying concrete pieces of material that we can do without for the time being. It's likely to be the biggest thing. And as far as creating, uh, I'm not, our intention is not to pile up a surplus. Um, if we do, generate any kind of surplus, um, which I would doubt given our combination of circumstances, but should we do that, uh, it will certainly be clearly tagged in many respects and also used, you know, for offsetting a tax rate. Yeah, I think one of the things that we ought to uh, uh, eliminate from my vocabulary is uh, a slush fund. Uh, and uh, last night when we were, uh, Dr. Goldman and I were in front of the town council, somebody asked the question, is if such and such an account was padded. Now, I think that if we curtail spending now and uh, have a surplus in an account because we're being very conservative, that's clearly a surplus, but it's not a slush fund. It's yes, not sir. padding. And with this planning tool that we're using and this budget process that we're going into, we are working toward more than we've ever been able to before a what you see is what you get budget. And that's one of the reasons we're going to eliminate, I hope, the, uh, the practice of rolling uh, over large amounts of money uh, and instead have a contingency fund so that if there is an emergency, we can deal with it so that we get to very accurate and uh, precise uh, budgeting. But whatever we do, uh, we're not going to have any Load of money floating around that doesn't belong to anybody. It's all going to be accounted for. If it's a surplus, we're going to call it a surplus. At least I hope you all agree with me. The reason I brought this up is for more public clarification than anything else. I'm, you know, I'm not well, accusing I th anybody. That's I think you brought up a good point, and I, I think we need to address tonight a little bit about we know we're not going to get more money from the state. I mean, we can probably make that assumption. We may get less. We may get a lot less. I think we have to look at, we only have a certain amount of time left to try to save some money. And I, my concern is that if we say uh, for the next two months, well, we can have field trips, what we've done is we've said to the kids at the other end of the spectrum, at the end of the, at the last two or three months of the, of the school year, well, you can't have school trips now, 
because we've got a budget crunch. We've got to make it up now in 90 days instead of looking at making it up over 120 days or 160 days or whatever we have left in the, in the year. I'm, I'm more concerned about saying what areas can we put a hold on now starting today and do it in a uniform fashion. And I'll, let me, I'm not picking on trips or, or anything else, but if we say, uh, if you were to come back and say we can save X amount of dollars and not have any field trips from now to the end of the year, I would be much more comfortable in saying that's, that's the policy now as opposed to letting some go and then arbitrarily saying the 1st of April, no, you can't go now, and you haven't had a fair and uniform um, um, application to the, to the cut or the, uh, I'm not saying this well, it's been a long day. I'm looking for a fair and uniform way of, of making these decisions and not an arbitrary one, I guess. Well, I would certainly agree. I think the difficulty with field trips, first of all, um, our, our bus drivers are also uh, custodian and maintenance personnel. That is, we are paying them for a full day so that some of the you know, local field trips are not costing us extra as far as driver or uh, driver time, which is a major cost when usually in, in many districts you have a driver that you hire for certain number of hours for the day, principally tied to your bus lifts. And I don't want to just harp on I don't. I just don't want to, I use okay. field trips as an example because Charlie brought it up before. That is one where you said, if you'd said the 1st of April we're not going to have any more, that obviously impacts kids right. differently than those two or three months prior. I'm, I'm thinking about, have you looked at the budget uh, overall and said, here are some things that we could immediately say to everybody, we're not going to do any more of these things? Or are you taking on a one-on-one? -on -one? There isn't a lot left in the budget at this point that you can say that to because, in fact, uh, I think, uh, frankly, the building administration as well as department heads, uh, having gone through some of these end-of-the-year crises, um, what they ordered and what they had in their budget for supplies, for number one, they needed. Therefore, uh, they should have ordered it by now if it was something that was um, certainly, uh, except for the kinds of things that are ongoing needs, as I mentioned earlier, those types of classes like technology, um, <coughs> and a good deal of material, uh, even in textbook or supplementary textbooks. But there are still some things that, that uh, were originally budgeted for that could be used. They have not necessarily been bought at this point, and we will be looking at those very carefully. Have you determined the amount? No, I have not. Here's what we've done, or we'll be doing the next uh, week or so. We're paying, we have a system upstairs where we pay bills within the 30 days. What we're doing now is loading all these bills with the due dates, and, and, and whatever is not to be paid will be encumbered. So all the outstanding purchase orders that are, are in our office that are not completely filled or partially filled or whatever will be encumbered and assume whatever the amount will be. Uh, at the end of January, when we do run the month-end report for the seven-month period, we'll have the expended amount in each account plus an encumbrance in each account. So we'll know what the unexpended balance will be as of Ju uh, uh, January 30th, let's say. And at that time, you know, Connie and I will sit down, and I think we could probably pinpoint an amount of money and assume that I've done the salary accounts for, for the whole uh, year, including the summer accruals for the teachers. We have that on the computer. We just have to put it up on, on a display. Uh, we can we can estimate certain things like you know insurances and you know, there are fixed costs there that will be paid that haven't been paid yet but will be. Uh, those will be encumbered. Uh, I think within a th hopefully two week period we'll have this okay. in the system. Good. Thank you. Going on. Next point uh, is a report on early admissions. I'd ask uh, Frank Miles. Each year we, in December, about 20 or 30 students apply early to various colleges and universities. Uh, when, when we speak of early admission, we're really talking about applications that go in sometime between November 1 and December 15th. And students anticipate hearing from those schools and colleges sometime between the 15th of December and, and uh, the end of January. Thus far, we have 22 students who have applied for either early admission or early decision. They're slightly different variations. Uh, 13 students have been accepted so far. Uh, six have not yet been notified. 
and three have been deferred, which means that they are still in the admission pool, but will hear on admission um, in the spring. Thus far, we have students who have been accepted by the University of Maine Farmington, William and Mary, Green Mountain College, Georgetown, Davidson College, Duke University, University of Hartford, Bowdoin, Catholic University of America, Williams College, Springfield College, Marist College, and St. Lawrence College. So I think it's been um, a successful uh, start to the uh, process of being admitted to colleges, and I think that uh, the senior class has a lot to be uh, uh, proud of in the, in the applications that they have made. I think most students are now just putting the finishing touches on their final applications, and I think they're going to be very successful. Any questions about that or the process? The really uh, crucial time for a lot of students is in early April, although a number of colleges and universities have rolling admissions, and they simply admit them as they make decisions throughout January and February and March. So we're sort of in that season, and those students who have heard are much relieved, and uh, those who have not are uh, waiting. And that's the way it's going to be. Thank you. And the final thing on my list, uh, I was uh, visited by a group before the uh, Christmas break, uh, an outfit or a school committee that calls itself SHAPE. And uh, when they first asked for a meeting, I was afraid it might be carrying a personal message, but they assured me it was not. Um, just, however, I said that I would uh, pass along their materials to you in your package you have a um, publication that they've been trying to put out. It's um, the one that, that is called SHAPE, um, and the committee members are listed for you with some various help tips of one kind or another. Uh, they also uh, send along a list of the activities that they have tried to be um, sponsoring, and in Sunday's paper, I think it was the uh, section in the Sunday Telegram that uh, is called Home and Family, if I have the right section in mind. There was an article about how employers, employers are trying to focus in on opportunities for employees to do healthy things like aerobics and exercise classes and so forth. So in the spirit of keeping employees um, not only healthy, wealthy, and we hope wise, the Committee on Shape wanted you to be reminded that they had come to you, I gather, as part of the budget process, perhaps last year, and I think the year before, they had asked originally for some support to go to a wellness conference, and that this was one of the concrete results of that work. So this is not asking you for anything at the present time. It is, in fact, a reminder that they are out there trying to follow up on that conference and listing some of the things that they have tried to uh, promote as far as uh, employee um, Help. So I noticed that there's a, an exercise class going to start uh, next week under the auspices of community services. So that's obligatory for board members. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, the stress reduction <laughs> seminar stress here. Reduction that's, uh, seminar. Well, that's yeah. the one. I think that's, that's the one they sent us. <laughs> anyway, I like tips on uh, on some of the cooking things too. So I. I really uh, am including that as a follow-up to uh, whatever information you've had uh, at their request. And that's my report. Good. Thank you, Connie. Yeah. The board chairman's report. Uh, Jan, would you uh, report on the superintendent search, please? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the school board's now in the process of reading the 40 completed applications that we received for the superintendent's position. Uh, we'll meet January 24th in a very brief public session, uh, then immediately go into executive session to uh, discuss the applicants and choose our semi-finalists. Um, each school is in the process or has chosen um, a, a teacher to sit on the interview committee, and we will be meeting in a few weeks to formulate questions to ask the candidates, and we hope to begin interviewing in February. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The School Space Study Committee report. Uh, Charlie, are you going to report on that? <clears throat> the School Space Study Re Committee has met three times 
and has completed two walkthroughs of all school facilities. At our last meeting, um, there was a recap of the high school walkthrough, a decision to, to enter into, to go before the, the town council and ask for some monies to, to undertake a consulting architectural study of the facilities. Um, there's a, a memo being drafted to that effect to be presented in February. Um, we're working on the interim report that's due in February on our preliminary observations. We've looked at a little bit at enrollment projections and, uh, and, and are in the process of drafting our building observations. So I'll have more for you in February. Thank you. Unfinished business. Connie, it's your turn again. Oh, okay. Um, as uh, if you were watching TV last night, you may be aware that um, I was uh, did go to the town council last night, asked for uh, permission to um, use the funds left in the uh, bond issue, uh, the original. I don't know what you call them, but anyway, the roof bonds that uh, you have been taking out the last two summers. We had about an $84,000 uh, figure um, that we were looking at, and I presented the material that I sent to you also in memo form indicating that we had an $80,000 cost we wanted to cover, and since that time we put it together, I received uh, one other change order for about $4,000. So I did ask the uh, council for permission to use the rest of the bond monies for that, and they did, uh, after asking a few questions, uh, vote to allow us to do that so that you now is a um, finished situation I want I am happy to report that we are uh, finished with the major portion of that um, reinforcement of the structure of the connector link and uh, we're really very pleased with the way the company that was involved in Alco company uh, was able to pull that off. We were concerned, as you may recall, about the timeline. Uh, they did, in fact, finish. There were a number of people involved in getting it done on time, including our own uh, maintenance custodial staff, uh, who did a wonderful job of getting a, a really kind of messy situation cleaned up so that we could use it. Um, the good news is that, that we're virtually finished there are, as they say there is a small change order there are a few things that still have to be done but as far as the major portion of the work it is done county do we have still have roofs that we have to shovel off when it snows yeah we had the portables in fact we had quite a quite a, a job this weekend um, our people as a matter of fact did that and then we have contract with the roofing company to do the piece on the high school um, those are things that we will be doing. I mean, uh, it's something that the changes that we've done and the structural repairs we made won't change that problem. That's just a. We will face a recommendation from the. Uh, well, I'll be receiving a recommendation from the structural design company on the portables. Um, we've talked about some options. I don't know exactly what their final suggestions will be. Uh, I certainly probably will be coming back with a recommendation that we follow their suggestions. I don't believe, from what I know at the time. Uh, that we're looking at a lot of money involved with that. I think it's, you know, there's going to be some money involved, but it doesn't sound to me like it's going to be a big issue. Um, but getting rid of that shoveling necessity will be important. I mean, for instance, we had heavy drifts on them this, this weekend, and they ha it had to come off. Um, the high school piece doesn't need attention until it's got a foot of snow on it or something approaching a foot of snow. Um, and the recommendation is to, frankly, just have a snow removal project, watch it, and, and uh, we have an ongoing um, understanding contract with the roofing company. It's probably the cheapest way to deal with that. The next time it is re-roofed, check the structure, do probably some reinforcement, and that will take care of that. Most of the high school is okay. Thank you. Okay? Thank you. And the second piece under unfinished business, which really flows from the first, um, we have received, uh, and I put in your packet some information from uh, the Department of Education, one of the recent bonds passed in the uh, November election. Um, apparently, and I say apparently because at the present time I'm not sure what the 
department is going to feel they can do with some of these funds. But I, since this is a bond issue that was passed, I'm assuming that that one is not going to be impacted by the current budget situation. So we're going to go ahead anyway and apply for reimbursement for the structural work we've just completed. Uh, we don't know exactly what part portion of that would be reimbursable. We think the major portion of it would be, and we're certainly uh, going to go ahead and, and uh, ask for that, as well as uh, as it shows on the list, the oil tank replacement. Um, and uh, we understand to put the, play, the paperwork in, we do need a vote from you. I believe the reason for the vote is that we are considering the following projects. Well, in this case, we've already done one. We are considering the replacement of the oil tank, uh, or two oil tanks, actually. Two. Two, right. Um, but a vote it would be in uh, approval of the superintendent submitting the paperwork for reimbursement, which I'm assuming you would want me to do. Would you like a motion to that effect? Yes, we need a motion. The minutes have to show that you approved of our projects. Does anybody so move? I so move. Does anybody so second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor? <coughs> New business, personnel requests. Okay, uh, in your packet I have given you some information. Um, and I just assume run down, unless you have any objections, I'll run down uh, the two together. First of all, we had a request for an unpaid leave of absence. It's a short leave and virtually completed at this point. The reason I'm including it is that I wanted you to be aware of the request and how we handled it and that um, uh, in case it went on for the additional two weeks rather than ending at the two weeks that you would be aware of it. Uh, as we would handle any unpaid leave of absence. And then, of course, we have the three people who have been uh, interviewed and that I am nominating for appointment for the positions that have become vacant uh, during the first part of the school year. Uh, those are in order. Gordon Crosby, full-time, 8 through 12 Spanish teacher, replacing Caress Pecor. Jacqueline Petrillo, one half time special education at the high school, sharing uh, with Ellen Brunel, who is now working half time and Sarah Berman, K3 guidance replacing James Freundler. Uh, all three of those positions, by the way, are appointments for the rest of the school year. As we have informed people, uh, as is our practice, when we have an opening that occurs during the year, the appointment is for that year only, so that the position will be reopened. Um, the person holding it, of course, uh, is free to reapply. So those Four personnel issues, the um, unpaid leave of absence uh, for Charlotte Hanna, the, uh, and the three second semester teaching appointments. Again, do you like a motion? Yes. We move that we accept the... Uh... Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? Charlie? Since one of these positions, um, specifically the Spanish teacher, I would just like the principal to address, well actually two of these positions, the leave of absence, short leave of absence, and the Spanish teacher seem to affect the eighth grade. And since this is the third Spanish teacher in, in the short school year so far, I would like to have, have it addressed by the principal of the school, the impact on the students. Are you asking right now? If, if that's out of order. Um, well, I... Okay, that, I think that's in the uh, context of discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, Nancy might want to comment on since it's eighth grade. I'm specifically the eighth grade because they have been impacted by many changes and now we seem to have had some personnel changes on top of that. Right. <clears throat> First of all, the um, leave of absence for Charlotte Hanna, <coughs> excuse me, is really Charlotte Hanna was experiencing some difficulty with a child care situation for her youngest child. Um, she came to Connie and I and asked for some assistance in dealing with that, so we granted the leave of absence. That position is being sub substituted by a person who was substituted for us before. Uh, his name is Tom Crane. He has a background in mathematics, and Michael Efren has been into the class several times to be sure that the quality of the instruction is carried forth, and we feel very comfortable that it is being done. Does it look like that will be limited to two weeks? 
um, the, her original request was for two weeks. She's going to let us know, I believe, by tomorrow mm -hmm. um, if she needs to extend that. And I have not heard from her. So my assumption is that Charlotte will be back with us on Tuesday. The Spanish position, and the reason Frank got up first is it's a position that we share with the high school. And it was my pleasure on January 7th to um, introduce Mr. Crosby to the eighth grade classes. And he comes to us with e excitement for teaching Spanish. He is a, a young teacher. Um, he's new to teaching. He's just completed, um, in December, he completed his student teaching at Gorham High School, as you can see on his Vita. But he comes um, to the Spanish classes with a tremendous amount of excitement for Spanish and energy for teaching. Um, he spent two years in the country of Colombia um, teaching himself Spanish and learning Spanish um, to be more proficient in it by having to, as I explained to the students, not only did he go to class all day in Spanish, but then he lived in the Spanish community. So he really had to become very, very fluent in the language. We talked with the students about this is a particular situation where it is the third teacher that they've had this year. Um, their first teacher felt she was going to come and that, that education and teaching was what she wanted to do. She <coughs> discovered after a short time that it was not. We were able to fill that position on a long-term substitute position uh, for a time with, Carleen, with Christine Carley, and she handled the position for us very well. Um, however, Christine Carley is not a certified Spanish teacher. Um, she's a, a young person who's interested in doing many things, and she certainly filled in the substitute position for us very well. We wanted to look very carefully at providing a program that would continue the high quality of Spanish instruction that we felt the students deserved. And that's why we had opened the position uh, for applications. Mr. Crosby was one of those applicants. After reviewing all of the applicants very carefully, we did choose to nominate him for the position. And from the eighth graders' perspective, um, they had enjoyed Ms. Carley very much and had worked with her. Uh, Mr. Crosby has inducted himself very well with the eighth grade students, and I think they feel very comfortable with him as a teacher and also feel that he is a person who really knows Spanish and knows how to teach and that they're going to be very challenged by his instruction as well. So it has been a disruption for them. Uh, for some of the eighth grade students, it is possible for people to have their child has been affected both by Ms. Hannah's unpaid leave of absence and by Mr. Crosby coming in, and that has happened both from January 7th on. Um, but things have been going smoothly, we feel, within the school day. Thank you. You're welcome. Is there any further discussion? All in favor? Thank you. Okay, the next item, uh, Connie, the request uh, for the by the administrators to form a separate bargaining unit. Yes, um, you have some papers in your packet, plus I tried to give you some explanation. There are two issues here. Uh, I suppose the, the bottom line issue is that uh, contrary to what perhaps some people may think, administrators uh, are covered by collective bargaining um, statute and may in fact organize. And the uh, steps for organization are once a, a group of people has decided that they want to be covered uh, by formal negotiating procedures, um, the first uh, paper you have there, and actually it would be appropriate for you to take two votes, is one whether or not you agree with the unit. Um, uh, just in case anybody is unclear about this, collective bargaining covers all members of a given <coughs> unit, whether or not they belong to the union. Uh, that's sometimes confused in people's minds that you have to belong to a union in order to be covered. Collective bargaining simply is a process by which the, um, there's an agreement between the employer and a unit classification mm -hmm. of a certain subgroup of employees to be covered by collective bargaining, in this case the administrators. Um, I have discussed this with the uh, people at the Labor Relations Board just to test my own understanding of it. The only question I had was how do we treat the athletic director's position since this is a position in this district that is part teacher, part uh, administrator. And uh, the way in which it's listed here is appropriate and uh, a person who is half-time teacher, half-time athletic director is appropriately actually uh, to the degree percentage half and half in two different units. So the position uh, is um, part of the teacher bargaining unit uh, and also part of the administrative unit. It may seem a little awkward, but that is the acceptable way to list it. 
everything else that's listed there would be appropriately listed in a unit for administrators. Uh, my advice to you in this one is to accept it as a unit appropriate for uh, that classification. If you don't accept it, you then initiate a series of steps by which you ultimately ask for a unit clarification hearing by the Labor Relations Board and would seem to serve no useful purpose. Um, that would be, but you must take a vote on whether or not you agree that this does form a class of like people, that is, people who share common interest. Um, the second step in recognizing a new unit is to determine whether or not the board wants to voluntarily um, uh, recognize this group as the bargaining agent for the people that it represents or whether you wish to ask the Labor Relations Board to conduct um, a vote, which is done by secret ballot. Um, and I had a discussion with uh, the chairman about this earlier. Uh, I'm advised by the Labor Relations Board that most boards do, in fact, ask for that vote. Uh, you don't have to, but if you're, uh, as I assume you would ask me what the common practice is, that is a common practice. Um, that means that the process then, the Labor Board sends a representative down. There, sorry, there's some papers that have to be filed and so forth, but. Um, in approximately a month's time, supposedly, if everything goes uh, according to their schedule. Uh, there would be an election, and the results of the election would be posted. Uh, you would be given a 30-day bargaining notice, and it's a 30-day bargaining notice for a new unit rather than the usual 120-day notice. So you would presumably be negotiating with this unit before the upcoming budget. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, one thing that I am confused about is last year John and I served on a committee uh, with, with some administrators to try and come up with a professional evaluation tool for administrators in lieu of their forming a, a, a bargaining unit. I guess I'm not clear why, what happened to that and why we're doing this instead of that. Well. Um I'm not sure that I can answer that. Number one, I didn't, wasn't part of you to that uh, process, and that um, I don't have an answer. I guess if one of the administrators wants to address it, um, that would be the appropriate answer. I'm not sure that we understood that it was in lieu of anything, and, and I think that we are interested in that issue. Um, I mean, we're not unwilling to discuss that issue either. I, I don't see that this is a quid pro quo for anything. That, um, and I didn't understand the situation last year as you did, nor do I think my colleagues did either. That, this, that the reason we were having that discussion last year was in lieu of organizing. I think we just think this, is, this formalizes a relationship that we have and that one that ought to be formalized. And uh, that's the reason we're making uh, taking these steps, if you will. Mm. Yeah, right. I guess I did misunderstand because I thought I clearly heard you say that um, you would not, we would not want you to form a bargaining <coughs> unit and you would much rather take it through those channels than, than do it this way. That's why it was a surprise to me. Okay. No, I, I, we didn't, I guess we just didn't see it quite the same way, but I, I don't think we're unwilling to still address those same issues we were talking about. I guess my question, and I don't know <laughs> how far I can pursue this or not, but but if there is no um, tool to be used in the evaluation process, if if that hasn't happened, how do you how do you do this bargaining based on based on what is what I don't understand? Well, wouldn't that be uh, precisely where the first negotiations with this unit would begin? I don't know. That's what I'm trying to find out. Well, evaluation is an employer-employee relationship, um, which basically goes on, whether formally or informally, for any employee, whether they are uh, organized or not. Evaluation ultimately deals with one's employability. Um, the kinds of contracts that are written for administrators uh, sometimes differ uh, in terms, uh, the use of various uh, 
you know, whether or not they're covered by just cause or whether or not they're covered by a whole bunch of other individual things that get into contracts. Um, but that really is not a factor of, of the evaluation procedure. I mean, evaluation is a whole separate strand. The way in which, uh, what happens when you, when, you, when you get into the collective bargaining statutes, um, employees have a right to ask to be organized and therefore to uh, negotiate for their working conditions, which may include language on evaluation, but the right to evaluate uh, is simply an employer-employee kind of relationship. Uh, as the contract becomes written and certain kinds of uh, procedural pieces get written down as far as that employment contract, if you will, I mean that relationship, then of course you do have, what you run into is that you do not uh, have the informal stance that you might have absent the collective bargaining situation where you might make some informal changes or changes, uh, in fact, some cases unilaterally. Um, there's just a whole host of things that go there, but it, I don't believe that the relationship between the evaluation per se and collective bargaining is necessarily on a direct line. I mean, it, well, it is here uh, in uh, certainly with the career ladder where there is a connection between the career ladder and the negotiations with the bargaining unit. But the career ladder is a piece of your contract, and to that degree it is covered by, the, it, it's a negotiated item. I mean, the whole point of collective bargaining is to the, that there's a systemic or a systematic uh, set of procedures that govern the way in which an employer now must deal with employees regarding wages and working conditions. Does that clarify the, that question? Probably not. <laughs> Uh, I need to know more, but I'm, I don't know exactly even what questions to ask. I just am not clear um, why this is happening at this point. Charlie? As far as the Labor Relations Board, there's no minimum. What is the minimum to be classified as a bargaining unit? Is there a minimum? Um, they don't like single units. I mean, single person units. They would try to put a single or one or two people would probably be uh, make some effort to uh, have them part of some other <coughs> unit. Uh, but this business of, of the, the uh, for your information, I think, I've been watching this over a period of time, uh, administrators are great, it's a trend to see them uh, organized. I mean, uh, if you look around, I haven't made any attempt to research this, but I am aware of a number of small uh, districts now where the administrative group either is organized or is seriously considering So I don't think it's a particularly unusual move. It's just maybe taking me by surprise. I didn't know that, but that is, if that is the case. Then our administrators right now are on a yearly renewable contract, correct? As I understand it, I, mean, I haven't actually researched all of them. Mm -hmm. I'm just having a hard time with where, where management, what now becomes management? Is it? exclusively the board versus the staff? Well, you're if, you're, we, if you're, we, if we, if we undertake another bargaining unit. Hmm. I'm having a hard time of where administration, management, and I don't know, I, I'm feeling a loss of control. Actually, um, your, your principal build, the principles of your buildings operate somewhat as middle management. Um, the only people who cannot belong to a collective bargaining unit in school districts are the <laughs> superintendent and the superintendent's secretary. Um, we are excluded by statute. Uh, everybody else may organize. And that is simply set up by statute. In other words, there's a whole body of contract law that, that kicks in on this one. And when you're dealing with collective bargaining, there's a difference between whether you're dealing in the public sector <coughs> or the private sector and what you're dealing with here, public sector statutes as determined in the state of Maine and so forth. Um, and I'm not sure, you know, I don't want to just go on and on about that. I mean, I don't know exactly what it is that you're asking of me, but in essence, uh, you don't have any choice as to whether or not the administrators may organize. They may, in fact, organize under Maine statute. 
Um, if you feel puzzled by the relationship or a change, perceived change in relationship or something, it's um, perhaps something you need to talk to them about. But as far as the law is concerned, your only choices are whether to dispute the unit that is set before you as a uh, suitable clarification, I mean a suitable unit representing people of like interests. And if you reject it, then you will trigger a unit clarification process. And I don't advise you doing that because there is no need to do that. This is a reasonable um, unit. Your second choice is whether or not you ask them to conduct a vote or whether you voluntarily recognize them. Um, I think that's all you really have a choice about. Yeah, I, I think my question was clarification because I'm seeing a private sector way of dealing with, with union, unionization and and what is management, whether it's middle management or it's management. <coughs> and I think that, that was what I need was clarification. Lawyers, I understand, are taught that they should never ask questions when they don't know the answer. I'm, however, not a lawyer, so I'm going to ask this question. Uh, Dee, you're uh, not a member of this uh, group, but you could be. Is that correct? Uh, I'm under the impression I cannot be a member. What about Sue? What because of... Okay. This is the, I mean, who else is not a member of this group and, and what uh, is the reason for that? Why, why don't, why can't you be a member? I, I just feel that I don't qualify to be a member, number one, because I know if the financial conditions or what, what is being offered or negotiated to other groups within the district per se and could use that as a, as a tool to influence the, these people that I would belong with. I, I like that answer, but uh, Connie, you said earlier that uh, the only person that's excluded is yourself and your secretary? By statute. Now, a business manager in some districts is a licensed uh, assistant superintendent, uh, which is, becomes a different kettle of fish. Uh, partly, they can't belong because they do, uh, you know, acting as a superintendent or they acting as a <coughs> curriculum person and so on. That's where you get into unit clarification. Uh, so that you sometimes have to straighten that out. Uh, I didn't ask questions of those who didn't come forward. I dealt with the issue as it was presented to me. Well, who is, uh, I mean, you mentioned Sue Weatherby, Loretta. That's the only name that I Is there anybody else in uh, guidance or? Uh, no, guidance is clearly is, uh, listed under teaching. Okay. Um, anybody else who's not in a unit will list the? Not that I know this will put everybody in a unit in our employ, mm -hmm. except for the three of you. No, mm -hmm. no. no. It, no. It still doesn't address. It still doesn't address a Sue and her assistant. Uh, the central office secretaries upstairs, along with the the uh, transportation supervisor and the buildings supervisors in both the uh, middle and high school. They're aware of this unit being formed. And I don't believe that the transportation foreman would be. I mean, again, I would probably seek clarification from the labor board on that, but I would, I would not think that that would be. Really well, I just before I ask for a motion that we recognize this unit, I just want to go through a certain amount of due diligence to make sure we're not leaving somebody out. Uh, this is not a subject about which I know very much, and I sense my fellow board members don't good, know very much about it either. Good questions. Thank you. I guess that's that's why I'm um, uneasy about it is that I heard basically nothing about it. I think I would have appreciated some kind of meeting or a principal calling or somebody um, talking to us about this a little bit before this was presented to us because I, I, I guess I don't, I'm not clear on what it all means. Well, I don't want to, I mean, I, I feel that I should not necessarily speak for the administrators. I, I think I can tell you generically what's going on uh, in the state in this issue, which is that administrative staff, unorganized, comes year to year to the board and to the superintendent, sometimes acts as an agent, sometimes doesn't, uh, and essentially deals with their salary and working conditions um, in an informal manner. Uh, and then goes through a budget process where increasingly, and I haven't been through the budget process here, so I'm not speaking about Cape Elizabeth, but increasingly in other towns that I am aware of, um, the taxpayer problem that we've all been seeing seems to get focused heavily on administrative staff 
criticisms of how much administrators are being paid and so forth. Um, I have seen that operating in other areas as a, as a uh, mechanism, I guess, if you will, or a reason why the administrative staff has felt that it wanted to negotiate. Now, I've had only um, a generalized conversation with the, with the crew here. I mean, you know, I'm sort of coming into this, and I can't give you, uh, nor do I pretend to speak for them. But Does I anybody want to speak I mean, a, and address it? Because obviously there's some questions that we have and some concerns. Well, Frank Miles is the president. Yeah, I, we, we did not mean to exclude you. We simply went through Connie, who we presume talked with Peter. And well, so yes, we that is true, and I, I must say that we, we, uh, uh, we uh, you know, I'm sitting here feeling a little bit uh, guilty that uh, I didn't uh, uh, think of these questions at that time. Uh, it seemed to be a, a routine matter, but I guess when we get down to the question of voting, I want to make sure that there's nobody else who would like to be part of this unit. No, we have, we have not spoken with, with either Gary Spencer or Charlie. Um, I, we did speak with Sue. Uh, we, we did uh, speak with Dee. And for, for reasons that I think are very appropriate, and I will let them speak for themselves, but they excluded themselves because I think they do not see themselves as managing the educational program in the schools. Mm -hmm. Dee has a dual position with both the, with both the, the town and the school department, and he, I think, spoke well for himself. Sue, I think, sees her program as somewhat outside the school administrative um, setup. She also, in a sense, works for the board, but is in a, in a, in a different position than the, than the people in, involved in what's, what might be called school administration. Yeah, so and I we, agree that would apply to we the building We limited it to those school administrators. Um, and uh, I, I don't think we considered um, Charlie or Gary in the same situation. We saw them performing different functions. Um, and that's why. Um, and, and I guess I, I'm sorry to have taken you, that we have taken you by surprise here, but I think we tried to follow what we thought were appropriate channels, and I think going No, you, you, follow, you completely and, and did so it through I, appropriate you know, channels. Uh, I'd be glad uh, to chat with you tomorrow or <laughs> at length, and, if you, and, and we'll do so. But I, I didn't in advance just because I thought it was usual to go through these Well, I did actually discuss it with several of you, didn't I? Can well, I answer? If you have any specific reach, questions, uh, I'll try to answer them for you. Yeah, I guess I'm satisfied that uh, it is a, uh, you know, that those I's have been dotted and those T's crossed and that it is an appropriate unit. Uh, does, does everybody agree with that or do you disagree? No, I agree with that. I think my concerns are the controls that we're going to lose because they're going to become a bargaining unit and we have to deal with that as a unit as a whole and not as individual administrators. And I think that's what's bothering me. Even though this is legally appropriate, it's the loss of control that I see. Well, that may or may not happen, but in any event, it's not, uh, it, uh, it's not part of this discussion no. or this vote. Because no, they have the right to organize, and really all we have to do is uh, make sure that it's a properly uh, constituted unit, and that, uh, and then make the decision as to whether or not uh, we would uh, want uh, them to hold a secret ballot. And it's my feeling that they should. Again, it's in the I's dotting and the T's crossing department. Uh, does anybody have a different view? And. Uh, do I hear two motions, or we'll take, uh, uh, if there's no further discussion on that point, uh, is there a motion that we <coughs> recognize this as a, uh, a I move that we recognize them as this group um, as the uh, bargaining administration or bargaining unit for uh, this group of individuals, and that we uh, suggest or ask them to take a vote accordingly. So we're doing it in... Uh, Okay, yeah. I think, I think we, 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 we the language for that would be that you accept this list as a proper unit. All right, let me amend my motion to say that I, we accept, uh, I move that we accept this list as the appropriate uh, group of people in this unit. Okay, is there a second? Second. Second. Uh, discussion. So that we're voting on both? No, no, just one. No, just one. Okay. For, any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor? It's a vote. Okay, now the second. Connie, is this a uh, <coughs> this is a motion that uh, that we ask them to vote? That's correct. Well, to ask Petition. to have a um, an election conducted by the Maine Labor Relations Board. Okay, an election conducted by the Maine Labor Relations Board. Yes. Do I hear a motion? Second. 
Second. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor? Good. Thank you all. And the addendum. Okay. The uh, the uh, last item on the agenda, new business, is uh, Barbara Powers' letter. And if I heard correctly, several of the members of the board, or at least one, did not get that. You did I've not get it. it. Did, did you, you've all read it now? Uh, was there any uh, uh, board reaction to that request that, uh, uh, well, uh, my copy is disappeared. Oh, here. You take my copy? No. Do you have any comments on that uh, request? I don't know. I guess I'd like Barbara to come up and talk to us a little bit about it. She's obviously as close to the, the budget situation that we have here as anybody and the request of $5,000 expenditure at this time for another part-time person must have a real good maybe reason. maybe you're just going to vote. <laughs> must have a real good reason. <laughs> well, uh, here's the truth. There's never been a good time to tell you this. How's that? Um, it, it was very apparent to us in late August that we'd overplayed our hand. We, as I indicated in here, by the way, for our audience, this is a request for an additional teacher assistant position in kindergarten one half time, which would be the remainder of the school year. Um, we watched our kindergarten numbers all summer and s stayed relatively stable, but are with sections running right around that 16 maximum that we had agreed was appropriate for our program. It started to creep up in mid-August um, to the point where we knew we were going to run uh, most of the sections at 17. Uh, it even started to break into 18 slightly as school opened, but we'd gone through that enormous task in early August of setting all the bus schedules, assigning teachers, and all the emotion that goes with learning who your child's kindergarten teacher is going to be. And Lynn Evans and I, the team leader, um, spent quite a bit of time watching those numbers and, and sort of crossing our fingers. The last couple of years have made us a little gun shy about coming to you in the middle of August and saying the numbers are, are of concern to us. We'd like to break out another session. Um, because the last two years, in fact, we ended up losing some kids after the school year started. And you scowled at me a couple of times because numbers dipped down more like 14 and 13 in a session. And I didn't blame you. It's just one of those terribly unpredictable things. As school opened, um, we, we did open with 17 and 18 in a section. Um, it was not a time to come to you in September when we were having roof problems and other crises of enormous magnitude to say, by the way, I'm in trouble in kindergarten. I chose to put it off. Uh, again, thinking maybe with some uh, attrition we might lose a couple kids. The teachers were terrific. They, they welcomed the children in. They had a real good start to their year. But as things started to, um, <coughs> to really get moving and kids were really ready to get going, um, they were keeping me abreast of the situation in October and November, really still concerned about numbers and being able to offer appropriate experiences to all kids with a limited amount of time they have in the day with these children. Uh, I asked them to do the very best they could for first semester. Again, we were still talking a lot about budget issues. It was clear to me that it was going to be a tough year. They did a magnificent job of recruiting volunteers. At Open House, they all had very large sign-up sheets, sign sheets and ended up getting literally just about a parent per session, so that we have eight parents daily coming in to help supervise about 45 minutes worth of time in the classroom when the teachers do attempt to do small group and individual instruction. And that's worked very well, and our parents have been very faithful within the limits of, of volunteerism. I also took it upon myself to scrape together any moments of time one of our other teacher assistants in the building had and sent her down to offer assistance in uh, remedial support whenever possible, and that came to about 45 minutes a day. That experience has, has been tremendously helpful, uh, though very limited. Um, I told the teachers that if they did everything possible to hold this together, I would be willing to come to you in January if, in fact, they still felt a need for some additional assistance. Um, and I guess I'm here to say that, in fact, they do. The, the piece I feel kind of better about coming uh, before you at this point is that with a change in one of our staff members, we have, in fact, identified some funding that would just about cover the entire $5,200 or so that it would cost us to bring in a teacher assistant. And that's a difference in some salary from a departing staff member and a newly hired one, as well as the fact that we've frozen most of our conference 
travel accounts. So I know that they're between that change and with $1,000 or so in one of my accounts that the money's there. When you, when you come before us with, and this isn't so much you as it should be the business manager, the salary is something, but when you say plus half benefits, that is money, and it would be nice to have mm -hmm. dollars and cents of mm -hmm. what approximately the total mm -hmm. cost of that position would be. Well, half benefits is a, can be a fairly big number. If it's a family plan member, it's over $2,000. True, but I mean... Just it, medical. And it would be nice to have some idea in the range of what those benefits for a half-time position is. I agree with this. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, is this a teacher assistant? Yes. Approximately fifteen hundred dollars benefits and uh, fifteen hundred for the remainder of the year. So essentially, we're looking at sixty-seven hundred, and you have that sixty-seven hundred in your salary account somewhere. I have, I have. What did we guess about a little over five thousand in because of the one change and because of some of the freezing that I've done within my account? I know that can be covered, Charlie. I think it's, there's some merit in the argument that the money is there due to this uh, change in personnel, but on the other hand, one could also make the argument that there might be a I higher believe. priority no, in some, some numbers that, you f that we're freezing now, or conceivably some higher priority at the high school or the middle school or somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So I'm a little reluctant to subscribe to the argument that, you know, mm -hmm. because you can self-fund it, mm -hmm. uh, it's okay to do it. Mm -hmm. I think I also have a, uh, and maybe this is just because I've uh, spent uh, a considerable amount of time looking at the budget, and uh, last night I spent uh, an hour before the town council describing a really very difficult scenario, one which almost inevitably, particularly after what we heard from the town council uh, last night about uh, keeping the tax rate uh, increase to 5% that we're going to have program cuts. We're going to need to keep the programs, uh, most of the programs that we're, we have now, we're going to have to work very, very hard. We're, I think, going to need uh, more volunteers rather than less, and I certainly commend those who've stepped forward and have helped you, but it's clear to me that we're going to need even more of that sort of thing and to add uh, any employee at this time in any position no matter how strong the case is and you certainly make a a strong case on academic grounds uh, it just is a very difficult decision for me I, I appreciate that Peter I don't come lightly and I that's part of why I didn't come right off but I did promised the teachers that if they tried all avenues and still felt some children are being underserved, part of my concern is is our support of them making some significant program change and then sort of lapsing on that uh, maximum class size issue. So I have kids, I have you know 11 and 12 year olds in fifth grade with the same numbers of kids that are five and totally dependent in kindergarten, and it's and it's been difficult. Well, uh, certainly when you look at it in that uh, comparative mm -hmm. sense, I uh, hear you loud and clear, but uh, uh, I have said more than once, I think in the December board meeting, and I certainly said last night in front of the town council that uh, it's almost inevitable in my view that mm -hmm. we're going to be looking at class size anyway, unfortunately. We are. Let me tell and you we just... we might as well get used to it. Okay, but here's my one pitch. <laughs> Our, our, our school as a team uh, is bringing a budget to the superintendent Thursday that continues to recognize the extraordinary needs of K-1 and 2 learners. And we are fully prepared to uh, propose additional sizes above that grade level. So we aren't ready to throw in the towel yet and say we're going to go to 18 and 20 and 22 in kindergarten. We just feel that with the program that's in place now, it will be highly inappropriate. So I'm, I'm not asking for something that will be gone with the wind in June. Uh, God help us. You know, we're really hoping to protect um, our five, six, and seven-year-old learners as best possible. With, so, so that's a piece, again, of the same theme. But I, I hear you. I appreciate that, all that needs to come into this. And I um, 
have tried to do my best as an administrator to give them every support I could to, to be able to offer appropriate programming. And I trust the judgment of the staff at this point. They aren't going to fall apart. They will continue to serve children. There just are some populations that could be served better for the remainder of this year. Connie? I have not been part of the decisions in the system to, uh, to deal with this particular issue, but I've certainly been part of decisions about early childhood education. Um, I have to tell you, I am surprised we're running kindergartens without assistance, period. I am really surprised to see a system like Cape Elizabeth that is, truly wants to be a quality education leader to start kindergarten without a teacher assistant that's regularly in place and is understood as needed at that grade level. Um, when I realized the situation, that was my first comment. Now, I'm not criticizing the decisions that you've made. I am merely stating a fact that I am aware of what goes on in other places. I think this is a, um, I recognize the difficulty of the position. I too have been in, in, and realize what we're facing. Uh, I think, however, this would be uh, within our budget scope at the moment and will give us a chance to um, look at the situation, but um, you would certainly not be flying in the face of normal practice for kindergarten if you bring the request. You've spoken um, about um, parent-child-teacher partnerships, and it seems to me that this might be a good place to put some of that into practice and in our budget times and um, um, with the things that we're facing, such as program <coughs> cuts and so forth, um, I think we ought to explore those avenues rather than add more personnel. Well, I certainly agree that the times are going to be ripe for looking for a variety of partnerships. I, I also, however, have had some experiences again in other places with relying on um, a combination of volunteer and um, and teacher assistant time. It's a tricky issue. I mean, you know, if you're a volunteer, um, your schedule may get impacted by a variety of things. Of course, that might happen otherwise. Those are decisions that I can't speak to totally. I haven't been part of them. I don't know exactly the process you've been using. I am merely speaking up because I have wrestled with this one personally, and I think it's a reasonable request. Well, a reasonable request is, is, uh, is one thing. Do you give it your unqualified support, and do you recommend it to us highly? Yes, I do. But I can't. I mean, my problem is that I hear your concerns, I hear Barbara's concerns. Uh, the, the, it is certainly a valid request. The difficulty is you are faced with, as we all are, faced with wrestling with the, um, you know, what are we going to do if we have a budget shortfall and so forth. I think the, the one thing I will say on kindergarten, it's, I have decided that if we can get kids off to a good start, you can save yourself a lot of trouble down the road. If this would help, so be it. In the schools that, that you uh, are using ex examples that have the assistance, are the class sizes larger? No. So it would be 16 students? In some cases, yes. In some cases, less. And in some cases, uh, more, up to 22, perhaps. But the, I, the notion of a shared teacher assistant among several teachers is a very common one and very helpful because it adds the, to the dimension of what can be accomplished. I mean, the, no matter how good a teacher is, one teacher with a group of children, augmented, admittedly, I mean, it really helps when you have the parents uh, helping. Uh, there is a limit to what you can do. So that the point of an assistant is not simply helping the over-busy teacher, it is actually expanding the attention that individual children get in some systemic way. And it sounds like it, it allows for cross-class Yes. interaction to that you would never have when you're it you're certainly there. adds to the variability of what can be done <laughs> let me go on another tack for a minute uh, D how uh, have you honed in our numbers uh, in the last couple of weeks since we talked about it in terms of uh, our uh, being within our budget this year still feel you know based on on December's printouts based on the uh, 
our, our, uh, I ran a report uh, Monday. We are at 50% expenditures for the, for the year, and that is like one payroll over the, the halfway mark, you know, the teacher payroll, administrator payroll. Uh, I still feel that forty, fifty thousand dollars is a reality uh, of said, a surplus. That's what we said in September, correct? Of a cash, final cash surplus. Unless the state comes through with some very deep cuts, but that, you, that I'm not aware of at this time. You, you, you're allowing for the state cuts that you mentioned earlier this evening. We're allowing for the state cuts, hopefully through some of this freeze that we've put on. Have you reconciled the uh, the head count that you were doing? Uh, between the Cato system and uh, the uh, the Mac system, it count as far as well. The staff, yes, yeah, employee by employee, fringe benefit yeah. by fringe benefit to, uh, and that's perfect. Not perfect. That's near perfect. This is perfect as you can get it. Near perfect. Yeah, you know, as far as I can tell, Peter. Yeah, we've made very minor changes, but uh, it looks good. Well, I guess uh, you know one could. Uh, it's not a very large number, and if the superintendent and the principal recommend it very strongly, uh, and if we have certainty that we have a reasonable margin of error at this stage, then one can maybe begin to consider it. But if we don't, <coughs> I, I, I don't. Th I have a hard time trying to consider it, and I think you've made a wonderful case. I think your teachers have done a wonderful job, job trying to, to do without for as long as they have. We're sitting here looking at one request. If we were to open up this to all the other administrators and needs of the school saying we had $8,000 to put against other projects, I wonder what kind of a case mm -hmm. the other administrators could make for their own situation. Mm -hmm. I, have an, I have a personal feeling that sends the wrong signal to, and I, and I realize there are kids that could be helped. There are probably kids that could be helped in the middle school with another assistant. There are probably <coughs> kids that could be helped in the high school with additional work. Uh, and I love the fact that we want to start off kids right on the right foot and kindergarten and first grade is an important place for that. I have a fundamental problem with adding people at a time when we're sitting here talking about less than one half of one percent of a leeway in our budget um, and that's where I'm at. Well I have a, I have a, t I mean I can go back and forth and I'm, I'm obviously thinking out loud a little bit here but uh, um, I'm torn between knowing how bad our budget looks for next year and uh, thinking, if I may be so plain, uh, what political message does it send if we add staff? And at the same time, we're crying wolf and, and uh, saying uh, the, uh, the sky is falling and other bad things are going to happen. Uh, I don't think we're saying that. We're saying we probably will have a $50,000 surplus at the end of the year. And we need to address what our needs are right now. But every bit of surplus that we have at the end of this year presumably carries forward into next year and could be used for something else. So it's, it's a very difficult dilemma. I think if we're looking at possibly increased class sizes next year, and Barbara's saying at this point she doesn't see her class size as far as kindergarten going much above 17 or 18 in her projected budget for next year, but it's hard for us to look at the total picture of class sizes in other, in other parts of the system and as as we have to reduce programs and in effect reduce staff and increase class sizes looking at the space and when in what some of these classes are going to have to go into we may have to use more of these these um, pseudo uh, teacher type um, aids to help deliver our program more effectively, or we are going to lose kids. We're going to lose kids through the cracks. And uh, you know how effective is one teacher going to be in a in a small classroom um, with you know say 20 to 22 kindergarten kids? I suppose another way to look at it is. Uh Next year, you, you, as you uh, intimated earlier, you're going to be willing to increase class size at uh, the higher grades. And you're working on your budget right now. So you're obviously thinking about that. 
would this teacher assistant uh, survive the most drastic <coughs> budget cuts that you could imagine for next year? I'm only asking for this as a, as a stopgap four and a half month assignment. This isn't a position I would see funding again next year, Peter. The you would not see it funding it next year? Not at this moment. The kindergarten enrollments are a puzzle to me right now. They're significantly lower than I had projected, and I'm watching them very carefully. This is, this is in response to those numbers creeping up higher than we thought they were going to. We have 141 children in kindergarten. We didn't project that. Have you discussed this with the Parents Association to see if you could get more volunteers in? And I think you discussed that in your memo. We really have had an outstanding volunteer response. It's simply that having trained personnel and someone with real educational background is what we need for the needs brought forth by these children. They're doing a marvelous job supervising children's work, which frees ch teachers up to work in groups. But it's still, with that many children, um, and, and they're very dependent learners at that age. Um, it's just proven to be very difficult. Um, and, you know, I would invite you to come in and, and meet with the teachers or visit a classroom. And, and I, I don't come before you lightly. I can't remember the last time I came to you in a mid-year request for staff. I know it's not easy. I appreciate the thought you're giving this, truly. But I'm only here because I, I trust what these people are telling me, and there are some children who could use some more support. And I, and I absolutely underscore what Connie says. Some of the growth we've even seen with some of this initial remediation efforts are going to uh, take away the need for those children having stronger services in first and maybe even second grade. Well, there's no doubt that all the yeah. research is on your side, all the literature that uh, has received so much publicity yeah. about Head Start right. program, and it's, uh, uh, if, you, if you get them early, Yes, and I really uh, appreciate Connie's, Connie's concerns with us about our paraprofessional staff. I've, I've told her that historically our teachers have chosen to go with low class sizes versus the 22 plus an assistant. This is what they did in second and first grade about six years ago, and they all had 24 and shared an assistant. And any time the first grade staff would take the, you know, 18 to 20 um, on their own, the idea of having 18 to 20 and an assistant is, is absolutely primo. We know that's not the kind of, we're not even requesting that. We're not even requesting it. No. But this isn't a position that you see funding for the fall? No. How do you feel? Board. Uh, well, let's vote. Okay. Uh, well, any further discussion? Uh, does anybody uh, have a strong view one way or the other? Or do you want to think about it? Uh, do we need to do this? Uh, uh, I, I think I have a, a problem that she doesn't, she's not foreseeing budgeting this position for next year. What's the difference? That's my concern. If we're going to have the same numbers. Of because class I'm not sizes. sure we're going, I'm, I'm not, Charlie, for the last three, we've been able to keep that top at 16. This is the first year in three we've gone above it. Preliminary numbers right now tell me that we'll be able to stay at our maximum. Of right 16. Now. Well, this is perhaps the first of our agonizing decisions. <laughs> they should all be here. The number three, I see, you know, the number three, remediation for children needing individual attention. And that strikes home to me at a time when I had a kindergarten child in a relatively large kindergarten class um, pre um, change in, in how you deal with kids' needs individually, and, and where a child of mine could have benefited from a little additional help mm -hmm. because the child was developmentally slow and not, mm -hmm. did not have any handicaps, mm -hmm. and we had to go outside the system to, to get this child help. In how many kids were in that class? Seven years ago, I can't remember. But okay. it was a relatively large but class, but no, I, I mixed. But isn't our dilemma going to be for the next months yes. that there will always be children that will benefit? There's no doubt whatsoever about it, and that's why I use the term agonizing. Uh, we know what the, uh, roughly what our revenues are going to be next year if the uh, town council uh, does uh, stick to what it, it indicated somewhat clearly last night, uh, uh, 
a 5 percent tax increase if the state revenues remain level, that we're not going to have any increase in our spending. Our spending is going to be almost exactly the same as it is this year. And that represents, uh, uh, if you say the inflation is 5 percent, that means there's going to be a decrease in our spending in real terms next year. Now that's the grim reality, folks. I, I, go I was just going to say, I think when we told high school parents last year that we didn't have enough money for a reading lab any longer to help those children, um, I truly think that, that to turn around and say, but we do have the money now for the kindergarten children in, in class sizes of 18 to have an assistant. I, I would be angry if I was. They got them a I reading lab. They got them a reading lab, right, Frank? I mean, you did provide for those needs for the people that needed the reading. Not a reading lab. No, but you did provide for those needs. Those needs. Uh, at least yeah. we haven't heard that you didn't. You said you would. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, what you did was find other ways within your budget to do it. That's right. So what we're saying, what, we're, what I'm saying here is that you have found up to this point other ways within your constricted budget to do it with four and a half months left to go. Mm -hmm. I commend you on your efforts so far, and I would say continue to do that, from my opinion. Any further questions or um, discussion? Does, uh, do I hear a motion? Uh, Yes, I'd like to move that we uh, provide a half-time kindergarten teacher assistant for the second semester. I'll second that. Okay, any further discussion? All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion fails. Sorry, Barbara. Uh, I would entertain a motion that uh, if there's no further business uh, that uh, we enter into executive session for the purpose of uh, discussing the upcoming negotiations with the Education Association. <laughs> yes. May, may I add an item to that? I received a communication from our attorney regarding your uh, roof settlement. Mm -hmm. I'd like to share that with you also in negotiation. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. Second. <laughs> All in favor? Okay. We stand adjourned going into executive session.